Christ. I had a seminary student write me a while back and uh, he said, and I know this young man, he's very godly. It seems he's, he's, he's immature like, like young men are, but he's got God's hand on his life. And he, he said, Brother Paul, I'm just so unholy and unrighteous and so ignorant of the things of God. And, and I have the gift of mercy, so I wrote him back and I said, young man, you are much more ignorant and much more unholy than you now know. And he, he wrote me back and said, thanks, I think. And I called him up and I said, listen, I said, I've looked at your life and much of the way you live convicts me of how as an older prophet I have become dull. I said, young man, you're probably more spiritual than I am. Well, no probably about it. But I said, young man, I'm happier than you are. And he said, I don't understand. Now listen to me. This might set some of you free. Do you ever get up in the morning and you have your quiet time and feel the presence of God and you're studying the Word and you seem to, God seems to speak to you and then you, know, you go out and you witness to everybody and you're obedient and, and boy, you, just, you did it right that day. I mean, you were just on top of the world. You, you loved your wife. You didn't kick the cat. You're, just, you're walking with God. And you're so full of joy at the end of the day. And then the next day you get up, well, you overslept. You shouldn't have watched that program the night before. You should have been in the Word. Uh, you didn't witness when you had an opportunity. And there's a real sense in which you're filled with sorrow. You know what that is? Idolatry. You have become the source of your own joy. Your joy comes from you and your continuous work. My joy comes from the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be obedient. I want to witness. I want to love my wife. And there is a real sense in which the Holy Spirit convicts me when I do not do those things. But the point is, poverty of spirit is a wonderful thing because when you realize... It's like I used to tell uh, young preachers, I'd say, in order to preach, you've got to have the power of God on your life. Now I tell them, in order to tie your shoes, you have to have the power of God on your life. You cannot breathe. Sometimes I get invited to church growth conferences. Not very often. But they'll talk about all these great things they're going to do. And, and then I'll, I'll get up and I'll say, let me ask you a question. I go, from where does every breath come? From God. From where does every beat of your heart, from where does it come? From God. Oh, so you characters out here, all you pastors and preachers and evangelists and missionaries with all these great plans, now tell me something. You can't even breathe. Your heart will not even beat except for the power of God on your life. Apart from any measure of grace in my life, I will be here to you today nothing more than a seething demonstration of egotistical flesh. That's all I will ever be. I was reading through Galatians this morning and I was so convicted. I was reading through Galatians and it talked about dissension and, and disputes things like that. And I realized that sometimes I do that with my wife. And, and it just showed me. It, it wasn't that, well, you know, I've, we just have a, a problem or we don't agree. The fact of the matter is, I'm in the flesh. I'm in the flesh. And I'm not relying upon the power of God. And the reason why I'm not is because I'm not poor in spirit. Someone says, well, I'm poor in spirit. How much do you pray? How much do you tremble? How much do you rely upon the wisdom of God revealed in His Word? Poverty of spirit. But isn't it wonderful, church? Listen to me. Isn't it wonderful that you don't have to be Something big? Actually, what you have to be is something low. 
something broken and humble, take the back seat, wash the feet, be timid and afraid of any task put before you so that it drives you to your knees. Realize when you wake up in the morning that I shall not move to my left or my right one quarter of an inch because without the power of God upon my life, surely I will fall. That's what the passage means in the prayer. Lead us not into temptation. It's a recognition of weakness and a recognition of a tremendous need of grace. Of grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, what a place. What a place. You know, back when I was a young man, not so much preaching about it anymore, but people used to preach all the time about crowns. You know, crowns. You're going to get your crowns. There's this crown of evangelism. There's this crown of this and a crown of that. I always wondered, would I really want to walk throughout all of eternity with like 400 pounds of crowns on my head? Do you remember when Jesus said the first will be last and the last will be first? When the first is last and last is first, there is no first or last. You draw a rabbinical circle. I am an itinerant Bible preacher. That's all I am. No one's ever going to know your name either. You're not big. You're not Charles Spurgeon. You're not George Whitfield. You're not a great theologian. You haven't swum across swamps in the Amazon to preach the gospel. You're just you. So what does that mean, this kingdom of heaven? Is it a place that you almost ought to dread because, well, there's a pecking order there? You know, there's these big shots. And then there's you. You know, there's all places. There are places that all of us can't go. You, you realize that. I mean, I remember I was no good at sports. You know, I never got picked for the team. Felt bad about that. There's certain places I don't go because I don't have the reputation. I don't have the money. There's all these places where I'm shut out. There's this pecking order in this world where I always have to take at least fifth or sixth or seventh place or down at the bottom or something. And many people think that that same thing is going to be carried over into heaven. Well, you know, when I get to heaven, I won't even see George Whitfield or Charles Spurgeon or anybody like that because they'll be so close to the throne and I'll just have a cabin on a hillside somewhere. Do you really think heaven is that demonic? The kingdom of heaven brings such joy to me because it is a place where the poor and spirit finally find rest and absolute acceptance. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you finally walked through a door where there's no longer any pecking order and where you no longer have to be anybody and you don't have to score a perfect score or anything else because everybody is only there because of Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be.